Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our webinar uh, on our series for the American uh, U.S. Civics course, looking first at lesson one, the origins of American government, and particularly the first section of that lesson, which covers the nature of government. My name is Paul. I am the social studies instructor here at Penn Foster High School. A couple of quick uh, contacting notes just to be, you know, myself, the rest of our educational team, we want to be available for you guys. We want to be able to ask, uh, answer questions. We want to be able to help and, and support you in your goals of earning your high school diploma. And there are a number of ways of being able to reach us, contact us, and be able to get uh, help and support. The first one is by phone, 1-888-427-1000. Um, Option five will get you to a member of our educational team, and we can certainly help you out from there. You can also text the word LEARN to 39033. Again, that question or that message will get right into the high school department and we can answer uh, any questions or concerns you have. The help and support page also has a variety of resources, um, including um, emails, frequently asked questions, and then also a chat and scheduling appointment uh, links. So a lot of different ways to be able to contact us right from that page, just by searching or looking up how to contact education or contact your instructors. A lot of good ways of being able to uh, reach out and talk to us. Um, as you all know from being here, there are both live help and webinar schedules available through your message center. Um, so please take advantage of those as well. We want to be able, you know, myself as a social studies instructor, I have civics and American history uh, webinars going on. Uh, our other web, our other instructors do have live help and webinars available as well. So please keep an eye out on those resources. And um, if you do have questions, there are again, variety of ways of being able to get in contact with us. This webinar is being recorded, so you'll get uh, that um, usually the following day. So about this time tomorrow afternoon, you'll get an email just like the registration email that you received. Um, so you are immediately able to go back and view this recording. If you miss anything, if you're unsure about anything, um, you'll be able to use that webinar recording to be able to maybe get a little bit more information, be able to reach out uh, you know, be able to see all these different resources. Um, as we go along, if you do have questions, please feel free to write them in. I will try to pause uh, as we go along to be able to go over uh, questions as well, along with the end. So I'll have some time at the end to be able to go over things uh, for all of you. Today's uh, webinar is going to cover two main objectives. First, allow you guys the opportunity to be able to articulate the purpose of government, as well as comparing and contrasting different forms of government. So that those will be our major objectives for today. Again, if you have questions, feel free to, to type them in, and uh, I will be more than happy to go over those. So the, the first part, that, or the first thing I want to cover is really the, the general purposes of government. Um, and, and there, the, the reading assignments go over the essentially big, big three. Um, the distribution of resources, settling disputes, and organizing work to meet common goals. And every government has these essential purposes. They, they certainly do them in different ways. They, they have certain things that they are more uh, influenced or more interested in doing than others, but they all have these general purposes. And at the US, at the federal level, we have our Congress, our executive presidency, as well as our judiciary, uh, the court system, all working towards these goals. Congress um, passing laws, debating laws, the presidency signing off on laws and then enforcing them, and then the Supreme Court and our court systems uh, looking at interpreting the Constitution, interpreting our laws, and making sure that they do meet the requirements set out by the Constitution. We'll cover more about these uh, three branches of government later on in, the, in our in our webinar series as you go into more of uh, more into the course of civics. But let's break down each of those purposes. So the first one, uh, the distribution of resources, and really what what it comes down to is is looking at um, the questions that are asked within within governments and some of them we'll, we'll talk in a little while about how they are factors of the type of government that that is that's in this in in that society 
And those two fundamental questions are um, who makes decisions, who, who's the leader of the society, and how do people make a living? And as we look at not only American history, also just in general world history, we see those questions become more advanced as society becomes more complex. There is, becomes a much larger need for a organized structure and organized society and government as we see a more complex society in which government then has to set greater requirements. You know, from the early days of civilization, we have uh, agriculture, or, or I'm sorry, we have um, hunting and gathering. We have groups groups of people within the society traveling around. They have, um, and then it becomes more complex when there's agriculture, when settlements are created, when a, when a people are set in one location. That by itself be makes a government much more complicated. That chief, that a government. Um, that society has to set up itself in a much different way between a hunting gathering society versus a agricultural or sediment, settlement society. Another big aspect of the distribution of resources is what's called the division of labor. And the key of that, st the, of that statement of division of labor is the idea that, that everyone in a society makes a living in different ways, that there are different jobs, and that those jobs are connected to each other. And it's the government's job to protect that, protect that, uh, um, protect those jobs and connect and, and protect that connection. So people are um, regulated in terms of their products that they can sell, the currency that they can take, as well as how people are able to manage their money, how pe people in business are able to treat each other. These are all part of what an organized society, an organized government has to, has to work with. And this leads us to our first poll question. The question is, what the division of labor, what does that mean? Does it mean that people in the same area have the same jobs, that people make living in different ways, or that people are trained for parts of the same job? What does the division of labor mean? I'll give you guys a, a few seconds to answer that. Okay, finishing up in three, two, one. Okay, thank you all for uh, for taking part of that. Um, you are absolutely correct that it is the w that people make live their living in different ways. So there are different jobs, there are different parts of a of an economy, parts of uh, what people do at, as their um, job within within a society. Are there any questions as we move on? No questions so far. As I said, feel free to, to type them in as we go along. Governments also are responsible for settling disputes. And that comes in a number of different ways. So first of all, it's written laws. So as I mentioned, Congress, as, as part of our uh, federal government, our state legislatures, our city councils, those are the groups, the, le the legislature, legislatures who are writing the laws that are going to be enforced by our police officers, by our executive branch, including the presidency, including the uh, uh, different departments that are, that are under the federal level, the governor at the state level, mayor or other forms of executive branch at the, at the local levels as well. And then finally, it's up to the court system at the top being the Supreme Court to make sure that the, the that laws are being followed or that they are settling those disputes over laws. And the final 
uh, purpose of government comes in as organizing work to meet common goals. And this, much like distributing resources, changes as we as we create more complex societies. In the in the early societies with hunting and gathering, the main things that our societies were doing were managing the the, the food that was coming in, as well as common defense uh, for that society. But as they become more advanced. First with agriculture, and then fast forward to today, we have our economy that needs to be regulated and, and look to be meeting the common goals through taxation, through regulations on businesses, as well as security as well. So looking at the, our military, looking at our police, looking at our enforcement agencies and court systems. So they are all connected. All, all, three, set, all, all three purposes of government are really essentially connected uh, uh, between these, between the idea that the government is is supporting the people that that are living within society. Any questions on the purposes of government? Okay, no questions so far. Moving on to the second part of, of, of the webinar today, looking at types of government. And the reading material really goes into two essential forms of governments, the authoritarian forms of government, as well as democracies. And the main difference between the two is, is, is where is the consent of the people or the consent of the governed? That authoritarian government forms of government have no consent. They're not worried about the consent. They are governing not on consent. They are governing on, well, well, we'll talk about the ways in which they govern, but they are not governing by the consent. Democracies, and we'll, and we'll talk about a couple of forms of democracies, they are governing under the consent of the people. That's how they form their power. Um, and, and that's, again, the essential difference. Democracies rule by the consent of the people. Authoritarians do not. They have different forms that they take power from. And we'll first talk about the, the different forms of authoritarian governments. The first one is called an absolute monarchy. And the way that I think about them is that they are based on the rule of the one. That a king, mo generally a king in, in, in most, uh, uh, in most uh, world history, and, and in certain areas it was called the, a divine rights of kings. And this happened uh, in number of uh, many times in the in world history, in which a ruler, a, a, the monarchy, the, the the king or queen, proclaims that the reason that they are king is because of a rule or a decree by a a religious being, a, a God in Christianity, by um, Allah in in in, in a. Islam in whatever religious group or religious religion in that country, that religious that that re religion's main gods called this person to be ruler and wanted this family to be ruling. And most famously, it was Louis the Fourteenth of France who called himself the Sun God. That he used massive amounts of the wealth within France to prosper himself to have. Um, New castles built in his honor, have statues built in his honor. He was sort of the the purest example of a absolute monarch who was only interested in himself. There were some absolute monarchs in history that that were uh, more respective to the to the people who who wanted uh, more control for the people. But some you know many absolute monarchs, most of the absolute monarchs, fell sort of in in the idea of Louis the Fourteenth. More, more interested in their own wealth, more interested in, in their own, um, their own society and their own wealth. To, in, in in modern times, over the last 200, 300 years, we've been moving away from absolute monarchies and moving more towards constitutional monarchies, in which the king or queen is no longer the ruler is as the single ruler of society, but is more of a figurehead. And, and the best example of that is really um, in, in, in the United Kingdom, um, Queen Elizabeth 
is not is is simply a figurehead. She is not making rules. She is not saying policy. She is the figurehead of the English of English government and English society. Um, in England, it's really the parliament as a legislature. It is their authority that runs the government that runs England. Another form of absolute monarchy is called a dictatorship. And that really takes control by the by the military. That's the military who establishes the authority of the dictator. And usually this is also a rule of the one that one general, one leader is is uh, named dictator. Sometimes it is called the rule of the few. And uh, the rule of the one, you know, there have been a number of, uh, of examples throughout history. Um, this one uh, uh, out of Uganda was Idi Amin, who was a single general who, who controlled uh, Ugandan society for a number of years. The rule of the few, um, there were some groups of, of, of dictators, like in the country of Greece, um, there was a junta or, or a group of oligarchs. Um, who were this rule of the few. And in general, these people, these dictatorships are ruled by br uh, brutality and fear, that they want society to fear them. It, they're, they're establishing order. They're establishing control over the people that are, that are in their country. And again, this can be either by a single general or a group of generals or, or a groups of people called oligarchs. Um, the, the former government of oligarchy means rule of the few. That leads us to our next poll question. An oligarchy is a rule of the what? Rule of the few, rule of the one, or rule of the many, which is the oligarch or oligarchy. Rule of few, rule of one, or rule of many. Give you guys a few more seconds. Okay, thank you. So again, um, we have 100% correct that it is the rule of the few. So rule of the one, mainly uh, within gen uh, some some generals as well as um, some uh, dictators. We know uh, those of you may, may remember the, in in Pakistan we had uh, Perez Musharraf, who was uh, a general. Um, he was a dictator. He, he, he took control and he was the singular dictator. He was the rule of the one. But in some cases, oligarchs, um, even uh, today's Russian government, um, though it's not a dictatorship, Vladimir Putin did not take control by military force, but he has a group of oligarchs, an oligarchy in which a few people um, take, have control of the government. The other form of authoritarian government is called a totalitarian state. And a totalitarian state is one that uh, that total control of the government and its people is held by this person or these people. And one, one perfect example was Adolf Hitler. I'm sure we all know of him. Um, he was freely elected um, by the people of, of, of Germany. Um, and though he was he was elected he started taking he, he he was constitutionally elected but then he started taking more and more control away from the constitution away from the people of, of germany and 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 subsequently took over the entire country as a totalitarian state um in which he uh, much very much like dictatorships controlled by, by fear controlled by brutality controlled by a few people under him um, the military, the police were all loyal to Adolf Hitler and his Nazi party. The Soviet Union under, uh, under communist rule is another example of totalitarian state in which a, a group of party, communist party leaders, uh, can, uh, part of the sort of another form of oligarchy, um, 
control the society, control the government, and then put one person in control as a premier, as, as essentially a, a ruler of that government. And again, this has total control. And the uh, leaders or premiers like Joseph Stalin really established a surveillance state in which everyone feared being watched and everyone who were who become opponents of Stalin would be watched and then would eventually disappear, would be put into labor camps, would be killed uh, by Stalin or her, or, and his men. Great, um, great amount of fear was established throughout the Soviet Union, much like in Nazi Germany, under these totalitarian states. But throughout history, throughout modern history, we see a number of examples of, both to of, all, of all three of these totalitarian forms of government. Any questions on any of these um, authoritarian governments? Okay, thank you. So now we move on to the democratic side of, of forms of government. And the first one was a, a is direct democracies. And th th the most famous example is, is in ancient Greece, in which citizens, which at this time were mainly property owning men, were given the chance to be able to make direct decisions, that there was a council who would vote for decisions. And, and it was all the citizens within Athens who can make these decisions about, about the city state. And it was ruled by majority. So the majority of the citizens would obviously get what they wanted. They would, they would vote as a group and be able to uh, uh, gain control, ha have control over the, the uh over the government. Today, we, we primarily see direct democracies in, in small towns. So sometimes in towns in, in uh, New England, some towns in, in parts of Europe, they have direct democracies, but it's only in small areas. Even Athens itself was a, was a relatively small area. We talk about Greece as a democracy, but it was really only Athens that was this direct democracy. And in terms of sort of a downfall of, of, of direct democracies is something called the tyranny of the majority. And what we mean by that is the, uh, that, that there's a very large opportunity by the majority within a direct democracy to take away rights from the minority. So if the majority wants certain rights even for themselves or want to take rights away from the minorities, uh, either minority opinions, minority ethnic groups, minority cultures, it becomes it, be, it is very easy for direct democracy to take away those rights. And that brings us to our next poll question. What is tyranny of majority? Give you
I'm sorry, I just realized I was muted. So I, I do apologize for that. Um, so the, the minority opinion, um, uh, the, the, the rights of the minority is what is, uh, uh, or taking away the rights of the minority is what the tyranny of the majority means, that even in the city of Athens, that there was a bit of tyranny of the majority in, in, in when um, the famous philosopher Socrates was killed uh, and tr he was tried and killed over his challenging of the of the majority opinion that he was put on trial. He was he was a uh, 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 he was a uh, he was put to death by having that min those minority opinions. So that is certainly a downfall, certainly a negative towards direct democracy. And then we finally come to a representative democracy. Very similar to the direct democracy, except that the participants are able, you know, participation is through electing representatives, that citizens are able to vote for the people who they want to represent them. And this is uh, generally much more um, popular within larger countries, the United States, many, many countries in Europe, South America, um, many nations around the world have a form of representative democracy. The most important part of a representative democracy is the legislature or the legislative branch. Um, in most cases, that is called the people's branch as a, as a group that is meant to be very close to the, to the people and the citizens that voted for them. So we think about our members of Congress, our House of Representatives, our senators. They are meant to be the closest people to their citizens because they always have to go back and vote, particularly the House of Representatives who go back and have to get reelected every two years. So they are very, they have to be very close to their, to their uh, citizens. Parliament in England, again, very similar to democracy. Thinking about the United States, we see throughout our, our history more and more people, more and more groups of citizens gaining the right of suffrage. Thinking about African Americans, women, um, even whites without property did not have a right to vote until the 1830s. So we have more and more, and more citizens as we go through the course of American history who gain the suffrage, gain the right to vote. Representative democracy does have downfalls. The first one being equal representation. Again, throughout American history, we do see groups gaining suffrage, but sometimes those groups do not get the right to vote or are not equal in their right to vote based on representation. We see this in, in uh, uh, court cases. Um, very recently, the state of Pennsylvania, uh, we had our, re our, our representation in Congress challenged at the state level, and the Supreme Court of, of Pennsylvania declared that our um, electoral map had to be Draw, redrawn to have equal representation for all citizens in Pennsylvania. The state of Wisconsin has has also had a challenge, um, and now I believe it's at the Supreme Court as well to be challenged. Uh, the the U.S. Supreme Court having challenges of equal representation, making sure that the that the congressional districts that are drawn are equal, that they are that they are fair. They're not just only based on how many Republicans or how many Democrats are in a certain district. Another another possible downfall of representative democracy is voting rights. We think we think about the 1960s, so uh, the, the Equal Rights Amendments or the Equal Right. Um, Voting Rights Acts, making sure that there were the ability of to vote for every American, most nobly African African Americans, that they would make sure that there were not rules or laws in place in a number of Southern states that would not allow African Americans or other groups, other minority groups, to have the right to vote in those states. And something that we're starting to see more and more 
in, in recent elections, voter apathy, that voters are just not caring as much, that even though we have elections only every two years at the federal level, um, voters are still become apathetic. They're not caring as much as a process. And that is partially res uh, a responsibility of, of the previous two bullet points, that when people do not feel equal representation, when they are feeling like their rights to vote is being challenged, they become apathetic. They become not as interested in going and voting. And this leads us to our final poll question. What is considered the most powerful branch in a representative democracy? Is it Congress or the legislative branch, the presidency or the executive branch, or the Supreme Court as the judicial branch? Which is the most important in a, in a representative democracy? All right, finishing up in three, two, one. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we we actually see a, a, a bit of a of a split between Congress, the presidency, and the Supreme Court. So let's talk about this for a moment. So the most the, what what is considered the most important really is the legislative branch. That it is considered the people's branch. That it's meant to be. The, the location, the, the place where representation is the most important and is the closest. So we, we think about our members of the House representatives, we think about our senators. They are the ones who have to go back to their voters and, and the least number of voters. Does, does the president have to be reelected? Certainly. We have presidential elections every four years. We had one in 2016. But when the president runs, he is gonna be running for the presidency of the entire country. A member of the House, that member of the House of Representatives, they're being elected by the, a small area of a state. And that's the location, that's the place where they are going to campaign. That's where they're focusing their attention. The president, he, he, you know, when President Trump ran in 2016, when he's likely running in 2020, he has to think about voters in all parts of the country. He has to look at who he needs to convince to be president. Um, a congressman or an, even a senator from a whole state, they have to consider how they're going to get reelected by that small group of people. And they have to convince though, that small group of people to vote for them and, and get reelected. So that's why it's, it's considered the most important because those are the people, those members of Congress, parliament, they have to go to that specific group of people to try to convince to, to reelect them, to send them back and, and say that they're doing a good job. And that brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, I am happy to answer any questions if you have them. Okay, well, I'm... I'm happy to uh i'll stay online for another 10 minutes or so um but thank you all for attending um if you do have questions please type them in um if you don't you are you're certainly uh welcome to leave um but you will receive the webinar recording tomorrow afternoon so watch for that in your email um and there are further civics webinars coming up uh in the next couple days um for the origins lesson as well as future lessons in the american uh, or in the U.S. Civics course. So again, thank you all for attending, and uh, have a good day, and good luck in your program.